Hey y'all, George Yates, developer advocate and AKA data guy over here at Astronomer. Uh, and I'm back with kind of another companion uh, video to a blog post I recently wrote called Advanced XCOMs. Well, not called Advanced XCOMs, but including Advanced XCOMs and trigger rules in a blog post titled Advanced Tips and Trips to Level Up Your Airflow Dax. And that title might change by the time of the actual publication. But I wanted to make this video kind of because I had a previous video you might have seen that was how to use Taskflow API and traditional uh, tasks together to create more efficient DAGs. Um, and that kind of sparked a conversation where, hey, that, that blog post might have gotten to be like 20 pages long because I wanted to include some of the different things that are a little unconventional around how you can declare tasks um, and use XCOMs in ways that, you know, maybe aren't using Taskflow API and traditional operator together, but are using them in more complex uh, configurations, little things that, you know, aren't typically something a beginner Airflow user would think to do uh, to hopefully inspire some of you out there to see, hey, maybe this is, could be really valuable in one of my DAGs uh, and go out there and actually use it. Um, so that's really the point of this video is I'm just going to kind of be showing you a bunch of different options for, you know, how you can effectively kind of harness the capabilities of XCOMs to make more efficient DAGs. Uh, and then after that, I'm also going to talk a little bit about, or not a little, but a lot about how you can also use trigger rules in different ways uh, to also create better DAGs. Um, you know, really breaking yourself free from the harnesses of purely cron-driven scheduling and actually having kind of event-based, uh, trigger-based messaging to create more efficient pipelines. Uh, so without further ado, I have a Docker image pulled up of a few different configurations of how you can use uh, XCOMs. And so you might have seen this before in the previous video, but we're actually gonna be looking at it, uh, not just as the task flow traditional operator cross ones, but uh, all the different other ways that you can use XCOMs here. So the first one I wanted to show you is just something that we actually did cover in my first video, but I wanted to just highlight it again, which is the ability to just add this dot output and get the default return value from a traditional uh, XCOM or traditional operator. So really quick way to kind of leverage, hey, I want to pull this XCOM. I know that there's this operator only returning one value. It's under the default field uh, and I just want to access it. Dot output is a really easy way to take that and then integrate it into a following task. Um, another really, you know, kind of, simple thing that you might not know is that while you can see, you know, you can def call any Python task, a uh, function, you know, decorate any function you want, you can import it, this can be an external file, it's gonna be defined as in the uh, DAG, just add the add task decorator, and it turns it into a task flow task. That's what everyone knows, right? But you, did you know, you can also call those same Python functions as normal functions. And so the way you'll actually do this, I switch over into BS code. And so let's say I want to go into one of my DAGs. Um, you see, I have this, this sender task, right? Or let's say I want to take this receiver task and just use it as a regular task. What I can do is actually just call normal function and then equals receiver task. Sorry, excuse my bad spelling, receiver task dot FN. And what this will do is just execute this like a normal Python function. So maybe if you have a task that you, or a function that you know, both need to be a scheduled task, but you also use it as a building block within another task, really easy way to implement that um, without having to kind of double uh, copy and, you know, maybe have one function and one task for the task. So just something a lot, a lot of people uh, know about. So I wanted to kind of bring the attention to the masses. Um, and so similarly, also, if you want to extract a traditional task from a task flow decorate instance, there's almost no reason to do this, but I just found this, um, you know, as an option. So if you want to ask instance, you can add this as my function dot task. And what this will do is just create it as a task, uh, not a task for API task, but just a normal uh, Python operator um, task. So I don't really know why you'd want to do this because task API is just a straight upgrade over a traditional Python operator, but it's possible. So just, just so you know. Um, and then another option is, you know, let's say I want to, you know, use the same task twice, but I want to override it. So I want to put a different parameter there instead of the default. Um, so, you know, this could be, hey, if you're just declaring the function multiple times with different inputs, but you want to have a default, so it has, you know, just a regular input. Um, you can actually use the uh, my task dot override command. So for here in this receiver task, what I would do is declare overridden task as receiver task dot override. Um, and then, you know, let's say I want to force an XCOM that isn't actually real. 
I would go XCOM receiver received and then overridden, right? And just pass an XCOM received. And then this will just be uh, overridden amount of treats, right? So useful if you know you have a default value, but you want to overwrite it. Uh, you want to make sure that it is forced overridden um, at runtime. Then um, if you want to, let's say you want to bring in a Python function, you want to declare it with multiple inputs. So if you imported your external function, let's say at the top of this DAG, so see I have my external module import external function. If I declare it in two different ways, so if I declare uh, one as sample and one as production, let's say, I could have this task, which is you know from an external function, it's a line defined either as sample data or production data. And these will create two different task instances of that task. So it'll treat it at, instead of being mapped instances, they'll be their own specific tasks. Um, and so this is a great way if you know you are using a re external function, but in many different ways, and many, many different inputs, and you need them to be distinct tasks, use this method, um, super, super useful. And then finally, uh, I wanted to also show you some different ways that you can do some repeated task mapping. So let's go over to, or you know, pulling specific imp out inputs from uh, upstream tasks. And so for this one, let's say I want to pull from multiple senders for in a single task that are upstream. Um, what I can do, so here, let's go back just to, how, you, let's say I wanna look at this receiver task. So let me just run it just so we have some example XCOMs as well. So I go look at this receiver task um, and what's happening within my receiver task task flows, I have input one, input two declared. And then the only way I need to, if I need to you know, pull from those two tasks is just reference them as their task objects. That's only, you know, obviously if they're traditional tasks it, or if it's a task flow operator and you're pulling from those. However, if you're pulling from a traditional bash operator, you will need to uh, use that ti.xcom pull method. Um, and then I also wanted to kind of switch over and look at the map method as well. So let's say I want to pull, um, oh, this is actually just mapping over. So the inverse of the one I previously showed you, we have a map sender task that's going to uh, four different receiver tasks. So here, this map sender task, you'll see is gonna have four instances, one to each receiver. And the way those receivers will call them is just by going, so actually one of them is receiving the full list and you can just say XCOM received um, and then feed in the map sender objective uh, task into absolute objective and then the receiver task if you go where is the declaration right here yeah so this is just taking in the entire uh, list however if I just want to take at, or print out a specific value I can bring in the whole list reference it uh, that one instance of as zero or you could just do X commerce you know have an intermediary step where you say hey X com received is used as an input here um, so you don't necessarily need to do that either and then similarly for bash operators, but just using that ti.xcompl method. Um, and so that's all the different ways I wanna show you around, you know, kind of how you can use task flow or not even task, but just xcomps to pass data between tasks um, in a bunch of different ways. Um, now I want to go more into the trigger rule side of things and show you a bunch of different ways that you can use trigger rules uh, to also create more efficient DAGs. Um, so move through the environment and switch over there. So just to give you a little background on kind of what trigger rules are, they are kind of the conductor within Airflow. Um, you know, there's always the symphony analogy whenever someone's talking about Airflow, uh, but they really are, you know, ensuring that every task runs at the right moment under the right conditions, um, and they allow you the flexibility to define those conditions. Um, so what I did here is kind of swip together a DAG that just shows every single way you can uh, use your trigger rules. Um, so here, what we have are just kind of two function or two tasks, Python and or success and fail tasks. Um, and then I have all these different dummy operators to show you the different trigger rules you have at your disposal. Um, so the two that are by default are all success and all failed. So all it means all the upstream tasks have to succeed for that downstream task to begin. Um, however, you could also have the all done, which means that uh, they just need to be completed whether they were successful or failure. Um, you can also have a, uh, so the all failed, uh, well, all success kind of makes sense. All failed basically is going to be um, for if you have like some kind of troubleshooting thing where all your tasks fail, then urgently send a five alarm fire, wake up everyone in the middle of the night, uh, something's gone wrong. 
all done is just saying that all those tasks have completed. So if you don't care whether some of them succeed or failed and you expect them to, um, doesn't matter. You can just skip them. Um, and so then if um, any upstream task fails and you want to uh, say, hey, you know, if any of these fail, then I want to trigger a task um, to send an alert out or to notify something if there, there's an, been an anomaly uh, because you're really sensitive to any of your tasks failing, that's another option. Um, whereas all failed is gonna require every task to actually fail. Um, so it's a little bit loosey-goosey on that. Then you have one success. So if only one single task succeeds, then you're happy and you don't, and you're going to go. Um, so where this could be useful is if you're like a product launch workflow where you have many different tasks that are always running, trying to update um, your backend database, right? Whatever, you know, reconcile on customer orders. Uh, you want, even if, you know, marketing doesn't need an update, you still have that part of the DAG, but you still want to update an inventory push, right? Um, one success is perfect for you there because it'll keep running that full DAG and, you know, run a quality check on your inventory check-ins, even if, um, you know, marketing hasn't, hasn't pushed their part of the pipeline, right? Um, and you can also define this with, um, tr all these trigger rules can be defined as like, so let me just show you an example. Uh, second. So if you wanted to have something like, you just didn't like the, you know, the trigger rule explanation like there, you can also do trigger rule, trigger rule dot none failed. Um, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but this is a video all about exploring different things you can do, not telling you why necessarily. Um, and then you also have none failed. So making sure, you know, hey, this is essentially the equivalent of all success, um, but none failed. So this could mean some of the stats could be skipped. Some of them could have be stuck and queued and the next downstream task will still trigger. Um, and so those actually one more. So the dummy trigger means that that task, a trigger will, our task will always trigger no matter what happens upstream, uh, which is basically a guarantee. So it's good for testing. If you want to make sure, Hey, this task is just always going to run. Cause I know that state is already uploaded. I don't need to regenerate it, but I just want this one task to run. Um, so super useful there. Um, and so those are just kind of, you know, the basic tr trigger rules, different ways you can you know, integrate that into your pipeline to help, you know, say, Hey, instead of meaning to have a Python function or some, Flex logic, just use trigger rules. They're built in and this is what they are built to do. Um, so then the next thing I wanted to go into is a little bit more advanced. This is a more recent feature, which are setup and teardown tasks. And so what setup and teardown tasks basically are, are a way for you to provision resources just for the purposes of a single DAG run, uh, and then delete those resources regardless of what happens within that DAG run. So th this is great for things like temporary tables. You know, if you're spinning up a machine learning cluster, um, you can spin these up just for the purposes of a DAG and then kill them right after without having to manually manage all that. And so what this looks like um, when you have created a set of Teradot tasks, and I'll take you over to the Python code in a second, is you'll actually have this little dotted line here where you have my set of task, it can be any task that you define. So this could be, you know, create table, whatever. It's a uh, decorator on top of a task. And then I have this uh, teardown task, which will run even if I have any of these DAGs in between it uh, fail. As long as that create snowflake objects task runs, then this cleanup temp tables will run. And you can see all done set of success. That means that any set of tasks have to be completed and then all the other tasks have to be done. And then this will run. If the setup doesn't run, then the teardown won't run. Um, and so what this looks like in the code is for our setup task, we're actually just defining it like a normal task where you'll define it as a setup or teardown task is all the way down at the bottom of your DAG. Um, so here, if you see, um, we have this create snowflake objects, uh, create snowflake objects, snowflake objects called directory stage as setup. Um, so this is how we create it as a setup task. And then you also need to have a dot as teardown task where you can also by default, it'll just detect, you know, is there a previous setup task? But if you want to, if you have multiple, you know, some you can actually have branching or loop, sorry, not branching, nested setup teardown tasks within uh, larger tasks. So you can have, uh, you can explicitly define, hey, this teardown task is linked to this setup ter task um, if you have multiple within the save deck. Um, and those are really all the kind of different tools I wanted to show you today on how you can use uh, XCOMs and also trigger rules. Uh, in 
more adventurous ways. Um, so I hope you've learned something that you didn't know before about XCOMs or Trigger Rules watching this. Um, and please, I encourage you to check out the blog post when it's released for even more code examples um, and some kind of additional context on why these are useful, some real world use cases. Um, and yeah, sometimes people just like to read more. Um, but without further ado, hope you all learned everything and have a good one. Data guy out.